Everybody, welcome back to another video on Financial Friends. Thank you so much for joining me today. We are going to dive into everything that has happened this week in finance, some things I found notable, some things we've already covered on the channel. So I'll refer you to another video, of course, but also touch on them briefly here. We're going to talk Netflix. We're going to talk Tim Cook, Apple, Kellogg, Pixar's latest movie, Lightyear. We're also going to dive into the world of the Federal Reserve a little bit um, and talk about some of this stuff again in the food world, Mondelez, uh, Kellogg, uh, and Kroger as well. So let's go ahead and dive right into things. I know I don't have my normal usual background. I set up this beautiful array of tabs here on the top of the screen and then I forgot to switch the background and I'm human so I don't want to go back and do it. Yes. So Let's go ahead and dive into things first. We had the market up today, 0.64%, 0.95%, and 0.162%, that being the Dow Jones, S&P 500, and NASDAQ in particular order. Now, at the beginning of this week, the market was closed. Monday was in observance of Juneteenth, so the stock market was not open. It did open sharply up, traded up on Monday, which is a little, or I'm sorry, on Tuesday, a little bit of a bounce up from the lows we have been seeing recently. Traded slightly, slightly, and I mean ever so slightly. I think everything was within that 0.1 to 0.2 range um, of a decline on Wednesday. And then today, which is Thursday, June 23rd, we traded slightly up those numbers I had already given you. Now, in terms of the market as a whole, we did have... Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell speak, and I have an article I want to pull up here to show you all in terms of the recent testimony that he gave to some senators, um, I think in Washington. Of course, those senators just tried to get him to say things he is not supposed to talk about and did not really talk about. Now, the Federal Reserve, if you're not familiar, is the entity that tries to restore price stability in markets, keeping a long-term goal of 2% for inflation, which is the increase of the cost of goods and living. Um, and they're also trying to keep the labor market or employment at healthy levels. Now, we do have employment at healthy levels right now. We do not have price stability in any stretch of the imagination. I know you were all familiar with that, seeing those big headline numbers of 8.6% year-over-year inflation, um, just a ton of inflation. I know all of your gas prices are high, your food prices are high, your rent prices are high. It's a thing, right? Um, and so what the Federal Reserve's job is is to curb the high demand that we're seeing for products. Part of the reason why um, those prices are going up its job is to kind of curb demand, to keep demand and supply in line, so hopefully we don't see inflation. What the senators want him to do is go in and change the price of oil, because they assume that's what he can do. That is not what the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell can do. Instead, all they can do is use the interest rate and their balance sheet to sort of cool down the economy, which essentially means take your demand and shove it downwards so that we don't have as much demand so either our lack of supply can become in line with demand or it buys time for supply to increase to kind of come in relation with demand as supply comes up, demand comes down, whatever. Basic economics. We want supply and demand to be equal. It's not right now. And what the Federal Reserve can do is push down demand via interest rates. Again, Senators think he can do way more than that. They think he can break up monopolies in the food industry. Um, he can't do that. Quite simply, he just that is not his job. They also asked him so many politically charged questions, trying to get him to speak on topics that are very political, which are topics and questions he should not be answering, because again, the Federal Reserve's job is to stay independent of the United States government. They are not they're not directly working for the U.S. government. Instead, they are working for the same people that the U.S. government works for, which is us, average American citizens, to help keep us with price stability and with jobs. Um, and so that's really what the Federal Reserve is trying to do. Politicians want him to play a game. He played politician back at them and essentially didn't answer their questions in a way that allowed them to take what he said, make it a headline, and then use politics to push a narrative. His job is to walk a massively thin, or I'm sorry, a extremely thin tightrope, um, which is don't say anything that makes people think there's a recession and don't say anything that doesn't 
turn away the idea of a recession. That's exactly what he said here, saying, look, yes, this is what interest rates can do. It's not our intended outcome to push into a recession, but they could push us into a recession. Walk a tightrope, push a narrative, because people, human beings, us, we can control a narrative simply by buying into it. We can push the country into a recession if we want to. How do we do that? Very simple. If they say, hey, look, there's going to be a recession, essentially what you're going to think is, okay, well, I shouldn't, save mo- I shouldn't spend money. I should save money. So you'll save money. That pushes down consumer spending, which is the main driver of GDP, which then takes GDP and pushes it down. If we had two quarters or six months of negative GDP, of GDP decline, we would be in a technical recession. The headlines would say, oh my God, we're in a recession. What would you do? You would save more money. When you save more money, it pushes GDP down further. We could fall further into a recession. What happens when we're in a bad recession? Companies stop hiring as many people because the prospect of green and profitable days are not really as high. They're not there because we're in a recession. So then they fire people and lay people off to cut back and to save money. And then you lose a job and then we fall further into recession because we don't have money. See what I mean? It's really easy. And none of that involved an interest rate. None of it. It was quite simply people scaring you into thinking there's a recession. So Jerome Powell can slowly but cautiously raise the interest rate so that slowly and cautiously people stop spending as much money so that slowly and cautiously demand can come down and hopefully supply can fall in line without too many people firing too many people pushing people out of work pushing demand further down meaning that we fall into a recession so Basically, you get my long ramble here that it is a very, very thin tightrope that he has to walk. And instead, politicians decided they were going to waste his time by asking him questions he can't answer. If you have three hours or if you put it on 2x speed an hour and a half to listen to this, it's very worthwhile. It's both funny, educational and entertaining all in one go. Go ahead and give it a watch. I highly, highly recommend it. Just Google Fed Chair Jerome Powell, and it'll come up. Uh, Put the word testimony or testify in there, and it'll probably pop up as well. Now, sticking in the world of consumer demand, we did have Kroger go ahead and report first quarter earnings for 2022. Um, They did have an increase in our brand sales in digital usage and couponing, uh, which is a really, really strong sign that the consumer demand is down, or at least the consumer power to purchase things is down. Our brands is Kroger's private selection or private brands, essentially store brands, cheaper alternatives to big national name brands. And so that means that, well, people don't have as much money to spend. They also saw a half a million person increase in digital usage, which is where you can digitally cut coupons for Kroger. That couponing program increased 11% in usage. Again, essentially meaning people are looking to save money. There was a same store sales increase of 4.1%. Not too sure how much of that was just driven by food cost inflation, but Kroger is doing its best actually taking a 26 basis point hit on margin to absorb some of that cost. Even those our brands, those store brands, those really, really hold the same sort of risk to pricing power as the big brands do. So if Kroger is not raising the cost of their our brands, of their own personal brands, what's gonna happen? They're gonna hold on to some of the higher costs getting the product onto that shelf, not raise the price, not as have as high of a margin. That is exactly what we saw here. In terms of positives for this business, they raised their dividend by 24%. We're seeing this happen over and over and over again. They raised their dividend. Uh, We had Target raised dividends, and I think there was a few other dividend increases that I might not have covered. We're definitely going to cover these on the dividend journey uh, portions of of the videos here on the channel. We're going to dive all into that. Go ahead, stay tuned for those. Mondelez went ahead and bought Cliff Bar for $3 billion, adding to their now one plus billion dollar snack business. They hold some of the biggest brands out there. This is really just a story I'm covering to show you the opposite end of what is happening in other aspects of the food industry. Belveda, Chips Ahoy, Cadbury, Honeymade, Halls, 
Oreo, we have Ritz, Sour Patch Kids, Trident, Wheat Thins, Triscuit, really, really big brands that Mondelez is bringing in. They've mentioned before, in contrast of what Kroger is now reporting, that these big name brands hold up and that consumers over the course of the pandemic, um, which was of course the last kind of two years, have found comfort in purchasing brands like Wheat Thins, Triscuit Oreos, these brands that they're familiar with. This is obviously starting to shift a little bit with Kroger mentioning that private brands, that store brands, were actually doing better. Now, on the road of this same food industry talk and in opposition of what Mondelez did, Kellogg split into three separate companies, allowing these businesses or, or new companies to focus on exactly what they are and what they are made of, that being snacks, cereal, and plant-based foods. We can see the breakdown here, $340 million business in Plant Co., $11.4 billion business in snacking, and a $2.4 billion business in North American Cereal Company. There's a video linked right up here in the top right of this. Check it out. It is my full breakdown of everything Kellogg, why they did it, why they decided to do it, what the future of the food industry has in store. But a quick overview, this is essentially more of a divestment than it is an actual uh, split. So the word divestment or what a divestiture is, is the process of selling a subsidiary asset investment or division. Kellogg is not selling these three businesses. They're actually just splitting them off. I think it's really clear here though uh, to see that the global snacking business is the biggest business here by far. $11.4 billion of net annual sales compared to the measly 2.4 and 340 million. The reason that people think this is really just a divestiture is you have 87% of the business or of the EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization tied up in one company. Do you know who's gonna run this company? the current CEO of Kellogg. So you can see like this is almost a, hey, we don't really want to taint um, Kellogg or JW Kellogg's legacy of building a big cereal brand. So instead we're gonna kind of keep around the cereal brand and oh yeah, also the plant one, which is really small. Um, and, and we're gonna keep these and we're gonna find new management, which new management is supposed to be found uh, in the next six months here by the end of the year with these three businesses then splitting off at the end of 2023, which is about a year and a half away. So they said they're looking for growth in all three. I think in reality, they're looking for growth in just one. That's the snacking business. And they don't really care what happens with the other two. I think that the North American cereal company definitely has the biggest opportunity to do something big. The plant company probably is gonna get gobbled up by some other business. Full video on that linked up right here. Go ahead and check it out up in the top right of this of course, after this video. Next up here, Pixar did go ahead, release the movie Lightyear over this past weekend. I went and watched it. It was a really good movie. It was pretty funny. It was a heartwarming movie. My girlfriend cried twice during the movie, which is pretty funny, um, but it just didn't have the numbers that people expected it to have. Uh, this is obviously a Disney brand, that being Pixar. It opened with $50.5 million in the UX box office. Now, some reasons why, um, some reasons that people, analysts, are assuming it didn't do as good. Competition in a recovering market. It went up against, which released the previous weekend, Jurassic World Dominion, and then a, I think it was late May when Top Gun Maverick released. That movie is still putting up massive numbers. It might cross a billion dollars worldwide, which is insane for a movie during this time. What do I say this time for? The box office is up 285% from last year, but still below 2019 levels. Um, and that's another reason why people are assuming Lightyear kind of had a miss. Um, there's also, of course, this confusing marketing, which I don't really think this is a big deal. Reportedly, Chris Evans announced that this was the origin story of the human Buzz Lightyear. Then Disney came out or Pixar came out and said, hey, look, um, it's actually when Andy got a toy from his fav favorite movie and this is that movie. I don't think this had anything to do with the lack of 20 to $30 million missed in sales. Those estimates came in from both Disney, which assumed that the movie could potentially do a 70 million. And then we had a box office pro predict 84 million. This is not the reason why they missed by this much. 
right? Uh, not at all. I think part of the reason, probably the biggest factor was the competition. And then behind this, which is, this is Pixar's first movie in a movie theater in two years. Over the course of the pandemic, Pixar has been the main driver of like a lot of Disney Plus content, releasing big like blockbuster style movies that would have been released in theaters on a streaming platform. And this was the first one that didn't release there. Now there's two ways you can look at this. One, Disney and Pixar are like, all right, let's regroup here. We're gonna put out an absolute massive banger of a movie in Lightyear. It's gonna hit really, really well. People are gonna love it. They're gonna show up to the movies and they're gonna see it. And we're gonna get away from having to release all of our content on a streaming platform where we don't maybe make as much profit. Potentially you could look at it that way. Or the flip side is, hey, maybe we should release a movie that isn't as big as this one so that we can warm people up to the fact that we're going to release a really big movie afterwards. In hindsight, probably a better strategy, but all things considered, I don't think you shift the way that you uh, release movies when you're releasing such a such a massive movie in light year. Either way, they did it this way. Potentially, it could still do really well. There was a report here, uh, Coco, which was another animated movie from Disney, did $50.8 million in 2017 and then went on to just skyrocket to $210 million in the U.S. and $807 million worldwide. Not too bad, right? So there's always potential that Lightyear can do this. I think a really, really good thing for Lightyear is this little guy right here, Socks. Socks was the kind of sidekick to Lightyear throughout the movie. Comedic relief, solved problems, was really engaging with, you know, the audience in the movie theater. It's going to do good. It's going to do really, really good outside of the movie theater. You can already see plush toys popping up, battery-powered versions, a, a cage for it. There's things selling on the third party on eBay here for $111. You have t-shirts and there's, I think, sock, yeah, socks over here. It's going to be just fine, right? This, this character is going to carry the weight of the world on its shoulders. In my personal opinion, I think it's really cute and it could do really, really well in terms of licensing for the business. Tim Cook came out with another banger of a statement saying, look, I could not be more excited about the opportunities we've seen in this space. This space referring to, of course, VR or AR in a big hint that they're going to release a headset. He also stated, I am incredibly excited about AR, as you might know. And the critical thing to any technology, including AR, is putting humanity at the center of it. I think there's a couple ways that Apple could do this whole mixed reality virtual reality headset thing. I think number one, they could release it for businesses, maybe for looking at homes, for architecture, for design. It could be a business play. It could be a consumer play where we just want you to play games on it. We want you to have fun on it. We want you to explore worlds on it. And then the third way they could do things is an educational play. We want to put this in schools, immerse students in their education, give them basically virtual field trips, or they could do all three of those things which is probably most likely build apps and platforms and develop for this thing so it can be used all around the world, all around the economy, all around an ecosystem. The one thing that I do still think that is a negative for Apple in this fight is Meta. Meta is building their hardware. Meta is building a metaverse. Meta has the name Meta in it, which is a part of metaverse. Like, People will associate Meta and the Metaverse. That's what they're going to do. How does this affect Apple? Well, right now you have Apple that builds hardware and they build software. But overall, Apple controls this ecosystem. They have the hardware. Meta is probably going to control the Metaverse because they're probably in the long run, even though I don't love the company, in the long run, going to dominate this space. They have the biggest name, the most resources, and Mark Zuckerberg is determined to make this thing work. Really, the fate of the company, long, long, long term down the road, kind of depends on it. I mean, they pivoted the whole entire company to do this thing. It probably should succeed. It'd be a terrible look if it doesn't. That being said, 
they're gonna have to compete with someone who now controls the hardware. And this is already a risk factor that people are acknowledging, that they're gonna be playing catch up behind all of these other companies that have done big things in the metaverse space. Apple, of course, tends to wait and do things right. We'll see if that happens. Last thing we're touching on here is Netflix. I wanna go back to an article that basically stated, look, we're continuing to lay off more people. This is something we've seen all over the economy, all over different companies like this. Seems to be more of, hey, we need to continue to trim people because we grew way, way, way too much during the pandemic. They've continued to do that. They're trimming more people. They first trimmed 150, now 300. No one likes to see it, but it has to be done for this company to save money because they're not growing as much. Plain and simple, they're just not doing it. Something that can spark it, something that I've talked about that could spark it before, is this ad-supported business. News came out, of course, think today, um, that look, there's some people in the mix. Comcast and Google both in the mix in terms of advertising for Netflix, putting the ads in the slots where they need to go during the shows on Netflix. This can do one big thing, and I really hope Netflix does this. If they don't just use this as a revenue driver, if instead they make it cheaper and more attractive for people to purchase a subscription on their platform, it will do better for them in the long run. They're going to bring in revenue. You don't need to replace all of the revenue you get from ads and cut that amount off of the subscriptions and give people a cheaper price. You could do it because you're probably going to see more people sign up, but at least pass a good portion of that new revenue stream onto the consumer so you can lower the price of your product and attract more people and hold on to more customers. If the premier player in the streaming space does this, they will be successful. That is exactly what Netflix has to do, in my personal opinion, to keep pushing forward. So let me know down below in the comments any of your thoughts on any of what I just talked about. I'd love to hear your opinion so we can have a fantastic discussion that goes on down below in the comments. If you made it this far, hit the like button. If you're not already, subscribe, hit the bell. That way you're notified when a new video comes out. And I will talk to you all in the next one. Take care.